Hey there, Nick Jutakis here. In this video, we're gonna go over some technical takeaways and things to think about when developing a payment system. Now, I still do contract work and basically development infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera, but I was recently helping out a friend working the counter at a pizza place after work a couple of times a week for a few weeks. And I learned what I think to be is quite a few new things here around how I think about payment systems. Because up until now, I've actually never worked at a register job in my life. And while I have built plenty of online payment accepting services here, you know, SaaS apps that maybe bill monthly or weekly or whatever it happens to be, you know, charging one-off payments. There were a lot of things that I felt like I learned just from being in a physical location. Uh, I actually highly recommend anyone to do that, uh, even if you don't want, you know, plan to do that long term. So we're going to go over kind of, you know, this whole entire blog post that I wrote out here, you know, technical takeaways, et cetera, et cetera. You know, just things to think about here. You know, we're not going to be going over any production ready code here, but if you're ever going to be developing a payment system, not necessarily, you know, like a cash register uh, point of sale system here in a physical world, but any type of payment system, you may get some takeaways here. So so placing an order and capturing a payment, two totally different actions. And, you know, I sort of had that in my mind when I developed my own systems, but it really becomes like mega obvious when you're dealing with this stuff in the real world. And we're going to go over a whole bunch of different, you know, practical use cases here related to uh, a pizza place, but really it has nothing to do with pizza. That's just uh, the context of this whole story because it applied to me personally. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of general takeaways there. Up until recently, never worked at a register or collected payments at a physical location. Uh, I've only sold online video courses where you basically start the checkout process when you're ready to buy a course there. And then I uh, you purchase a digital item within a couple of seconds or minutes, however long it takes you to fill out the form there. And uh, yeah, so I was helping a friend out recently, worked at the counter at his pizza place for a couple of weeks, basically a couple of times a week for a couple hours, uh, like, you know, around dinner time there and on the weekends uh, on Saturday and Sunday and Friday and things like that. And uh, yeah, totally different world than uh, doing remote programming and making YouTube videos. So I'm actually probably going to end up making a little bit more videos around this idea of uh, what it was like and what I learned from working at a pizza place in a programming context. But this video and post is going to be all about payment systems uh, in general. So let's go over the workflow here, which happens many, many times a day, uh, just placing an order for pickup, right? These are things you may uh, encounter in this type of setup, right? Customer calls in on the phone to place an order for pickup, right? They want to buy something like a lightly cooked pie and maybe six garlic nuts, right? Whatever they want. Uh, you put their order into the POS system, basically the point of sale system. You know, I'm sure you've seen clerks or register workers, uh, you know, clicking buttons behind uh, what you can see there. You know, there's putting in your order and there's maybe a cash register attached to that as well. So each item is listed, uh, there as its own line item, right? It has its own name, its own quantity, its own note, its own price. Uh, you know, you may have quantity six for garlic knots, or maybe you have a special menu item where you just get six, or you can maybe purchase one at a time. Maybe you want two slices instead of one pie, you know, things like that. So, you know, on the phone here, you ask for the name and number and put that into the system. And then uh, on your end, you're basically looking at uh, a total that's calculated with sales tax and, you know, sales tax, tax in itself is a separate line item. And at this point, basically an order gets created and uh, the following things happen when that happens. So the order is placed into in progress and maybe there's a little icon showing uh, it's not paid for yet. And uh, by the way, quick aside here, like being paid or not is completely independent of the order being in progress. So after that, like a receipt is going to be printed at the register, which is going to be marked as incomplete. And again, you know, these words and exact processes here are going to be a little bit different depending on what system you have. I kind of go into that in a second here. But um, yeah, also an order is going to have another printed out for one pie here where the pizza maker can actually see it. So, you know, the person taking the order over the counter likely is going to be the different uh, a different person than the one making the pizza here, at least in this case here where you have a couple of employees here. So yeah, step seven over here. This is going to be a little bit different depending on what POS system that you're using. For example, there's Square, there's one for Shopify, uh, all sorts of other different ones. You basically, you know, it's like an iPad terminal with a, a cash register attached to it and like a little terminal to accept credit card payments and stuff like that. Um, but the general concepts here are basically the same where, you know, an order is being put into the system with a status. And a human workflow is being executed here to track that order physically and receipts get printed. So I should have mentioned here, right, like uh, after that receipt is printed, uh, the register is, is incomplete, you'll go and maybe hang up this receipt, you know, somewhere near the oven where you can just see a list of different uh, receipts in a row, almost like tickets, right? Uh, pending ones, they're incomplete. Um, but at no point in this workflow have we even even discussed anything about capturing a payment. Right? These are very different and, you know, they can happen at different times. So for this pickup order, there's a, a few different ways that a payment can actually be collected, right? So while on the phone with the customer, uh, they can just give you your credit card details and you can go on the same terminal that um, another customer may put in like live at the store here and just type out their credit card number while they're saying it to you out loud. This is actually pretty common. I took quite a number of these. You know, our above workflow here, 
it's basically the same as what we see here, but uh, step seven is gonna be a little bit different because you're collecting payment at the time of creating the order. Uh, but the other way to do it is, you know, if they're placing an order for pickup, they're gonna stop by in 20 minutes, whatever. Uh, maybe they pay with cash or credit right then and there when they pick it up. Also very, very common. Quite a bit more common than people giving their credit card number over the phone. Now, there's a whole bunch of other ways that you can uh, accept orders here as input, right? They can order it online and pay for it right then and there online. Uh, they can also do delivery where maybe the delivery person accepts the payment there in cash or uh, again, yeah, they pay it online here and it's all done. So yeah, there's all sorts of different ways to have inputs here and we're going to get into more detail about that later, right? All right. So, you know, now let's say, you know, there's placing an order for pickup here, 20 minutes passes by. So now the customer comes in and they're ready to pick up the order. You know, at this point, you may have accepted, I don't know, 10 other orders since they called 20 other orders, 50 different orders could be anything, right? Uh, you know, some might be in progress, some might be completed. These are completely asynchronous, independent orders being created here. You know, maybe someone popped in for uh, two slices and they were in and out in three minutes here. So, you know, back here on step seven, we did hang up this receipt. So uh, we know exactly what order is associated with this customer. We have their name and number, et cetera, et cetera. It's all there on the receipt here. So, you know, you check the receipts that are hanging on the wall there and you notice the order is number 137. Doesn't really matter, right? In this case, the POS system, it counts from zero every day. So like the first order of the day is always number one and it keeps going up and then the next day it gets reset. So you go back to the POS systems in progress tab here. You find order 137. Yep, there it is, pending payment. So yeah, now you can see the full total of the order, see if the customer has uh, maybe cash in their hand or maybe a credit card because at this point you're time to uh, accept payment from them, right? Uh, potentially also they could have their phone if they're doing like Apple Pay or Google Pay. Uh, if not, you know, you kind of just ask them if they want to pay with cash or credit and the POS system typically will just give you some buttons to choose which one. Uh, maybe it's the price could be a little bit higher if you have the transaction fees for uh, credit cards or not. Also kind of interesting, I didn't know this, maybe this is a uh, specific to whatever POS system that you do. But if someone is using Apple Pay, uh, at the POS level, you just click credit and yeah, they just, I don't know, tap their phone next to the terminal and, and it just works. Kind of interesting. So yeah, if they pick cash, you know, you input the amount that they give you and it all auto calculates their change, um, right? The, the order is for 15 bucks or whatever it is, they give you uh, 20, then you can even give them five back the change, right? So if they pick card or any other digital payment type like Apple Pay, whatever, they can just use the terminal to tap or insert their card or device, whatever. It's gonna get authorized and then hopefully be successful here unless their card has issues like, you know, it's maxed out or, you know, maybe there's a gift card that has no more funds left, which we're actually gonna get into in a little bit here. And sorry, you know, this is like sort of not super obvious stuff, but we're just setting up the stage for what it's like to actually pick up an order here. So in any case, right, if the payment is successful, then uh, a couple of different things happen here, right? The order is now marked as completed in the system. Another receipt is printed, except this time we have uh, payment information, right? Maybe the last four of their credit card, like it's Visa or something like that, the amount paid, sales tax, all that stuff here. And, uh, you know, you can save that receipt. You can put it on one of those like slammer type of things where you have like a nail and you put the receipt in there. Maybe if the owner wants a physical receipt, maybe the customer requests that uh, you print an additional receipt for them, you know, things like that. So yeah, uh, you remove and throw away the hung incomplete receipt th uh, there, so you know it's done, right? This is the one that uh, it's almost working as like a Kanban board, which we're gonna get to in, in a bit here, right? Now, another interesting takeaway here though is like the pizza maker, uh, they threw away their printout for that pie completely independent of the order being completed, right? From their point of view, uh, they're completely finished when the pie is either placed in the oven or out you know, depending on if the counter worker kind of knows how to gauge when a pie is ready to be taken out, right? So if the pizza maker is putting stuff into the oven and then they're done because the counter worker knows how to gauge like how long that pie needs to take and, you know, they're on that, then uh, yeah, the pizza maker done at this point. But, you know, if the pizza maker is dealing with the oven, then maybe it's when it gets out of the oven, right? Because he needs to monitor and keep track of all the different pies and whatever else is in there, right? So, you know, at this point, you have a clean slate. The order is totally completed, right? It has been moved through the workflow. Depending on how busy a place is, you know, this might might be executed this workflow up here uh, 50 times, maybe 300 times a day with surges coming in around, you know, popular lunch times, like noon, one o'clock, whatever it happens to be. And, you know, popular dinner times, right? Six, seven o'clock, uh, whatever it happens to be time zone doesn't matter. Or, but yeah, so if you need to go back to an order also that's already been completed, you, you can totally do that. You can print as many receipts on demand as you want. And uh, if there's been a payment captured, then you can also have the option to do a full or partial refund. By the way, we're gonna get into some technical stuff in a second here. Um, but yeah, there's a lot more to go around just like general payment details and things, but let's go over a couple of different technical takeaways just from this most basic, you know, uh, picking an order up here for pickup. So yeah, going back down to technical takeaways. By the way, this is hosted on localhost 
Now, I didn't mention this, but I will leave a link to this in the description where it will be live by the time that you watch this video. So yeah, there's a couple of different takeaways here. Just going over the above stuff and, you know, a couple of different things to think about while taking orders and uh, observing the system because, you know, I wasn't working the counter all the time. Sometimes uh, someone else was there to do that. And I kind of just like soaked in the atmosphere of the place, you know, just discovering the workflows and things. So, you know, if you're building out a system, uh, you may want to think about uh, database terms and relationships here for some of the technical takeaways here. So, you know, I quoted some of the words here that could technically be database tables or models, you know, if you're using an ORM, something like that. So one takeaway here, an order, a product, and a payment, kind of totally different things. So an order really pulls together multiple products into something that can be associated as a thing. But in my opinion, you know, it's not quite like a join table between a product and a payment here, right? So order 137 in our example here has N number of products, right? In this case, it was the pie with six garlic knots, but it could be 10 items, one item, whatever happens to be. Uh, but it also has X payments where X can even be zero if the order happens to be free. You know, I'm sure maybe your local pizza place has a deal or, you know, maybe you're familiar with this idea of, you know, you buy 10, you get one free. So if you just uh, save a punch out card or something like that, you can go and redeem your free pie or, you know, Zeppelis or whatever the heck you happen to get there. Um, but you would still want that free pie or whatever it is to go through that workflow of being tracked, like hung up there as a receipt and it goes through the whole entire workflow. The only difference there is uh, you wouldn't collect a payment, right? So this order and payment, definitely different things here. And so yeah, an order, uh, also has a status here to clearly show the stage in order is at, right? You can almost think of it as a Kanban board where it kind of goes from left to right. It goes from created to in progress to completed. Uh, maybe there's some other states there depending on whatever system that you have here. Uh, also a product has variants and notes. So a pie uh, in terms of sizing here, at least at this place, you know, again, this is going to be a little bit different depending on where you go. But, you know, this is the idea of like a, a 12 inch personal pie. There's a medium 16 inch pie and a large uh, 18 inch pie, which commonly is just basically a regular pie, at least in New York, uh, in the US. I don't know where else, uh, everywhere else in the world. They have different sizes, right? But, um, you know, a customer, they may want full pepperonis or meatballs, you know, maybe they want half and half, maybe they just want half um, sausage or something like that, whatever they like, or maybe they want two complete full toppings spread across the entire pie. So the pie can also have uh, no notes at all. And by the way, these aren't notes. Maybe these could be seen as variants or toppings if you're using, um, you know, specific terms about pizza stuff, which it is like that in the POS system here. You know, these are labeled as toppings and we can have half and full, etc., things like that. One more generic term here is variants. Um, but yeah, the pie can also have uh, notes or maybe no notes at all, right? Um, typically a note is something specific that the customer wants, like as such as like lightly cooked or maybe crispy or well done. You know, these are decently common pizza terms for how you may want to have your pizza. Um, there's also just no notes at all. Just assumes like, yeah, just like a regular pie, right? No special cooking instructions there or notes. So yeah, in my mind, at least like a variant and a note are pretty different things, right? A variant is something the customer can choose when making the purchase uh, and it may or may not affect the price, right? A variant uh, are kind of standard things, right? If you were selling t-shirts instead of pizza, you know, maybe the size is there, maybe the color as well, right? These are different variants, right? Uh, and notes are sort of just like ad hoc customer requests, right? Like maybe they want a pizza with no cheese, which funny enough, like actually came up more than once, which was kind of interesting. It's sort of like ordering an egg sandwich at a deli with like no eggs, but I've also heard that before too. So anything goes with uh, folks here ordering food here. But um, yeah, you could say maybe if enough customers have the same request, that could be a sign that maybe you can turn that into a variant, right? But maybe not always, right? For example, if 90% of people are okay with a normally cooked pizza here, you may not want to have them explicitly uh, choose between, you know, regular, light, crispy, or well done, since it does complicate the order process, especially if it's online, where they have to click through a couple of different form fields, like radio buttons or drop downs or whatever. Uh, there's no need for them to really choose all that stuff. Even if it did default to regular, still it's clutter, right? Uh, on the other hand, you know, requiring them to pick uh, large or small is a good idea, right? That seems like a reasonable variant since those are kind of different products with uh, different prices, right? However, if you were just selling shirts, you'd likely want colors as a variant, right? Uh, even if they don't adjust the price. So, you know, your mileage is going to vary if uh, something is a variant or maybe, you know, a common note becomes one. Totally up to you in that case. Also, now this one, you know, I knew this too, and I actually did do this, did do this but it's, man, it's so crazy how the mind works when like, you just see things in the physical world and like a million light bulbs just click. But like a receipt is uh, completely immutable, right? Uh, well, immutable is completely in the context of the word itself, but like, you know, a receipt is created at a specific point in time and it reflects the details at that point in time. You know, it may or not be, may or may not be printed, doesn't really matter here, but there's a really very important distinction because, you know, even if you don't print out orders onto actual paper, you wouldn't want to modify old orders with different details based on future events. For example, 
you know, if a pie right now costs six dollars or sixteen dollars and ninety-five cents here, and you have a thousand orders that happened in the past here, right? And now you decide, like, you know what? Ah, man, inflation, whatever, blah blah blah. I want to bump the pie to seventeen ninety-five instead, right? A dollar more. Uh, you can't just go back, right, to those one thousand orders that happened and uh, just have them be referenced at a seventeen ninety-five price, like. Uh, no, right? Uh, the payment was already collected at sixteen ninety five. That's a done deal. Done. It's already been transacted maybe weeks ago, months ago, or whatever it happens to be. So when you are dealing uh, with building out your database tables and models and things like that, you probably shouldn't have a reference to a product's foreign key to dynamically grab the price when you render the receipt. Now, if you want to have a reference to the product for whatever, uh, you know, maybe you can just um, denormalize that, right? Put the product name in there, the price, uh, whatever it happens to be here. You know, these this way, all the details here, and that's what denormalize means. You're basically putting all the different details here. You know, that's all self-contained in that one row, right? It should be an individually rendered thing with its own separate data. Changing data in another table and then having this thing get modified. Uh, that's not, th not too good for a receipt, in my opinion here. So yeah, that's a couple of takeaways just from our basic order for pickup type of thing. We're going to go into, you know, some now uh, maybe some other ways you can place orders. And we're going to kind of go over some uh, takeaways from that as well. So, you know, in the above example, we handled the use case of a single counter worker entering in an order through the POS system here. But that's not the only way orders can be collected, right? Um, if your POS system is integrated with a website or app, customers can place orders online. Uh, they still need to come up, though, in your system as in progress. Though in this case, the order isn't completed yet, but the payment was captured. You know, online orders still get receipts hung because hanging the receipt is an indicator to let the workers know, you know, if a customer received their order or not, right? Is the pie in the oven? Is it not in the oven? Like, what's going on? Uh, does it need to be ready in 30 minutes, 20 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour and a half? Like, whatever it is, right? Um, but what's interesting here is, like, completely, again, independent of a payment being captured or not when it comes to this, like, in progress date here. Uh, this cannot be tied into a payment, uh, different things. So additionally, orders can also be placed through things like DoorDash, which may or may not even be integrated into your POS system. You know, if not, you might get the DoorDash order through a different system, but the idea of hanging a receipt while incomplete can still hold true. Uh, we're going to go into more details about that and some takeaways here. But yeah, lastly, you know, if we go back to someone taking an order at the pizza shop, there could technically be multiple point of sale systems and multiple terminals to accept credit card payments and other type of payments. Typically, you'd only have one register, but, you know, you could totally have two different uh, POS systems where you can deal with, you know, taking the order through a menu system and collecting at the very least credit card payments or Apple Pay or, you know, any non-cash payment that's supported here. So, uh, you know, now we're talking about distributed systems here, even though these things might actually be like 15 feet away from each other. But um, yeah, in that case, like every point of sale system that you have there, they really need to be in sync. So the orders and the statuses and all that stuff is basically real time, you know, soft real time in the sense that like, Two second delay is probably not going to be the end of the world, but you can't have uh, a 20 minute delay or something crazy like that because it's going to be very, very confusing if uh, POS system one says something and POS system two says the other and they're printing different receipts with different statuses. Like, yeah, this is bad. In fact, actually, their point of sale system had an issue where this syncing problem occurred and uh, got to the point where, you know, I'm a computer person, so I checked it out. I did everything I could do. Uh, I could do their literally iPads. So we rebooted everything, went through their support. They ended up having to actually send a brand new iPad because one of them, I don't know, according to them, there was a hardware failure. So whatever it was. But um, yeah, other than that, though, you know, multiple POS systems here, it's the same as our original plan of taking orders at the register. Yeah, what's really nice about this one, too, is like that hanging receipt workflow totally holds true. Doesn't matter if you have one system or two or 10. So technical takeaways here. Well, maybe 10 would get interesting because, um, you know, you're kind of dealing with a lot more. But Technical takeaways here, and at least in the DoorDash case, right? It's uh, really kind of an interesting idea that two completely different systems or inputs can still funnel into the same workflow for ensuring an order is fulfilled, right? In the DoorDash case, uh, all the orders are already paid for. You're only really keeping track when the DoorDash delivery person picks it up here. So them picking it up and marking the order as picked up on their phone, which is basically a button they can press and we can confirm that before they leave the place here, is the action to complete the order on our end. Uh, at that point, you know, it's the delivery person's uh, job to go and fulfill that to the customer here. So, you know, that opens the door for a POS system, maybe to integrate with a third party order collection system, such as DoorDash or whatever else, right? Uh, there is a benefit of your POS system offering that. 
But um, yeah, I know having the orders in one place is totally very nice, right? Right, that's the benefit here. So at the place I worked at, uh, they were actually separate. So you know, there was this iPad with a register, and then right next to it, there was like a I don't know, like a mini iPad there that was just like a DoorDash system here. And this one actually didn't even have a printer hooked up to it. So when a DoorDash order comes in, it's something like uh, I don't know, an eight or nine hex code as the order number or something. So like we wrote down the order number, uh, whoever ordered it the amount that it was for and, and things like that. And yeah, we had to actually do that by hand here and hang that up there. Uh, hooking up a receipt printer for that DoorDash order is a, a short term to do item for them. They basically just need to get a printer from DoorDash, but I don't want to get too deep into that. But uh, the real takeaway here though, is just thinking about like separations of concerns, abstractions, and the flexibility that's actually available when you have decoupled systems like this. You know, having, um, I almost said data dog here for DD, but having DoorDash integration, you know, it's kind of uh, a quality of life improvement, but it's actually not an necessity. And if you want to talk about abstractions here, I mean, think about the pizza maker on the back end here. They don't really even need to think about this, right? They just get their receipt in the back there for, you know, wherever they happen to be here. And, uh, you know, I just need to make a pie before X time. Doesn't matter if it's coming from DoorDash or it's coming from somewhere else. Now let's talk a little bit about multiple payments because yeah, this one is always fun here if you're designing a payment system. So most orders probably are gonna be cash or credit on their own, but technically someone can pay with both cash and credit. So this actually happened on the first day I was there where someone had, uh, I don't know, like a $14 order, but they paid with both a gift card and the rest was cash. So their gift card had like six bucks on it left, like 617, you know, some uh, odd amount there, and they just paid the remainder in cash here. So separate to that though, like, you know, this idea of paying with two things at once. And, you know, technically it's not limited to two, right? You can even have like four of them, right? Maybe they have a couple of gift cards with like 18 cents left and you just want to like, you know, basically finish those up. But um, separate to that though, you may actually need to collect additional payments after a transaction has been completed here. And hopefully, by the way, you know, I'm kind of going through this blog post here, but if you're building a payment system, you can start to really think how you may want to model, model, model your stuff around here. And now, it doesn't mean you need to do all of this stuff, like, you know, if your orders need to support multiple payments, because maybe you're just accepting digital uh, payments online where, you know, you don't even want to support the idea of multiple. But if you're building something that does, well, yeah, interesting things to think about. And we're actually going to go a little bit over, you know, using Stripe or uh, Shopify or Square or, you know, just using them as inspiration on how to model, model your stuff here in the end here. But yeah, separate to that, you might, you, might, uh, you might need to collect additional payments after a transaction, right? For example, and this actually happened quite a few times where someone placed an order online for a regular pie that's normally $16.95, but they put a custom note in there that said, like, add buffalo chicken as a topping. And, um, you know, that's not free, but some folks kind of do this on purpose because when they check out the item online and they make a purchase, it's a $16.95 pie, but they put this as a note here. And, uh, you know, this type of topping, and this one is $5.50. I don't know. Some people try to do it for free, but... Um, you know, they should have chosen that as a topping through the menu system and it would have been calculated into the total um, before they paid. Now, if they're trying to do this as a trick or, you know, try to pull one by you, then um, yeah, of course they're not going to add as a topping, but other folks, most of them just make an honest, honest mistake there, right? You know, maybe they're not used to using online menus or maybe the POS system software for dealing with that kind of isn't the best here. So in any cases like this though, you know, we'll go back into the order and then actually charge an extra 550 onto their card or, you know, whatever uh, this end of, ends up happening to be here. Now the POS system, it does allow you to add an extra dollar amount to the order. As long as it's under a certain amount, you can just go and charge their card, card for like 400 bucks, right? I think it's some uh, small percentage based on the total, or maybe there's some like some minimum amount and then a percent on top or something like that. I vaguely, vaguely remember one order being like around 27 bucks and like we were allowed to add up to like $6.43, something like that. Um, but in any case though, all this can actually be done without contacting the customer in like 95% of the time. And, and actually that's what the customer wants most likely. So, and we're not, tr we're not trying to pull, pull a fast one on them as well, right? So like we always let them know uh, when they pick it up or maybe we deliver it to them that we made the adjustment and it's also on the receipt we explicitly pointed out like everybody knows uh, the details about everything here so they're fully fully aware of the charge when they receive their food so now in the very 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 off chance which actually i didn't even see once happen here you know if they don't want that extra charge for the topping and uh, uh you know they ordered uh whatever they ordered you know we just refund them for that topping or you know i guess in that case we would just if we happen to have an extra pie we would just give them a regular pie and uh or maybe we let them choose the or keep the the topping for free, whatever, 
totally depends on the situation right here. And uh, of course, a local store is much different than online. You know, most business owners are okay with making you happy. And I'm not saying online wouldn't do that. But, you know, you have a much more personal experience when you're face to face with a customer. And, you know, if you're talking about a local pizza place, you know, this customer may come in today and next week and two weeks from now and, you know, stuff like that. If you try to take advantage of that situation and you're doing this stuff all the time, like trying to pull a fast one to get a free topping here, you know, business is going to notice that. And if you continue to abuse a system, who knows, you know, maybe they'll choose not to do business with you anymore. But um, some technical, technical takeaways here. I don't know, I guess a way to describe all of this is basically an order has many payments, right? It's not necessarily a one-to-one -one mapping between an order and a payment there. So when designing your uh, database setup there, multiple payments for one order, totally possible. Uh, even zero, right? We went over that where you can have maybe the buy 10, get one free type of thing, but you still want the order. So when displaying orders or showing receipts, you know, make sure that each payment method has its own line item, right? So if you're paying with a card, and like a different gift card, those should be two, two totally separate uh, line items there in the receipt. And again, going back to things being immutable, uh, yeah, that's just for that one transaction there. So, and now let's talk a little bit about uh, avoiding things out and refunds because they're slightly different here. So once in a while, you may create an order that hasn't received the payment yet and you wanna go and cancel that. So uh, this could happen if let's say you've made a menu adjustment on the back end of your point of sale system, right? Maybe you have like an admin panel or uh, you know some back end for that where you can adjust prices for stuff. But you wanna make sure that the front end is completely up to date, right? This is where the counter worker would actually be placing orders here as well as customers if they're ordering online. So. Uh, this specific POS system that we use, it will actually auto create an order as soon as you select any item. So if I just like select a pie, it's going to go and make an order and the order uh, is going to have a number and everything like that here. Now, personally, I don't like that. Uh, I wish there was a button to kind of just create the order when I want so I can fool around with the system here because it really does make training more difficult because there's no training mode or like a special, you know, mode of operation that doesn't actually create you know, orders in the mainline area here. You know, there's no like development environment or test environment. It's like basically just production all the way here. And it's actually kind of annoying because those order numbers start at one every day. And uh, it's kind of nice just to look at that and be like, oh yeah, you've got like 286 orders yesterday. But then you go and look at it and like 15 of them have voided out here. So it kind of messes up with like your ordering sequence to understand how many real orders you actually had at like a very quick glance here. But in those cases, you can cancel or basically void the order out here. Still shows up as an order, except it's been canceled with no payment. Uh, it doesn't end up in completed or in progress. It, it's basically just uh, like a canceled one or void, whatever the term happens to be here. But, um, you know, having this audit, tra audit trail for this is actually pretty useful because it does help the business owner protect against theft from employees, right? So, you know, imagine if you didn't have a complete order trail of everything, you know, an employee could technically ring up an order, cancel the order, and then just like pocket the cash. So having that order trail is, is kind of nice there in, in that regard. But uh, also separate to voiding, there is this idea of a refund and a refund, there can be both a full and a partial one. So uh, this will happen on any order that has a payment. There's basically a refund button. And when you click that, you can have the idea of doing a full refund or maybe partial or a specific item. Uh, you know, you click the topping for the thing and it's going to give you like the 550 or whatever the topping happens to be there as uh, the amount all filled out for you nicely. So yeah, sometimes you, you need to refund the whole order or maybe just one specific item there for it. You know, in our case, we can also add a note to the refund. So we and the customer know why, right? We can, you know, just put that there and that ends up being reflected back onto the receipt, which is pretty nice, especially if you're dealing with someone picking something up later. Uh, it's always nice to have notes around here. And uh, yeah, some technical takeaways on this one. You know, generally speaking, when dealing with money, having more information is better than less. Uh, you may want to have an audit trail covering every event here. You should be able to trace through these events and basically recreate that order uh, backwards and forwards, right? There should be no uh, leaving things up to Im imagination here. Everything should line up to the exact cent. Now, Stripe actually does a really good job with this if you've ever used them before. I'm sure maybe Shopify and Square do as well. We're actually not using any of these three, by the way. Um, it's a different system. Kind of don't want to say it because I don't know if it's local to New York and it might be, but anyways, like I just don't want to, you know, leak where I was actually doing this work here. And there's a lot of pizza places in New York, by the way. So yeah, Stripe does a really good job though about this events. Like you usually have multiple events being tied into a specific payment or a charge. You can see different payment and types, like if refunds happen or payment intent types, also refunds and stuff like that. It's all there in like a, you know, a way that you can read it as a timeline. They all match up and the event data itself is actually locked in at the time it occurred, right? It's uh, immutable as well. In Stripe's case, it's basically just a big JSON blob, but everything you would ever need to recreate that order or payment, whatever it happens to be here. And then also there is this idea of a customer, right? It's also super useful to collect information such as at least the first name of someone who's picking up an order. So it can be added to the receipt here. Maybe you write their name
name on the box. So you know, like, okay, cool. Like Tom is picking this up at uh, 7.15, roughly, something like that. Um, having their phone number is also really, really handy in case you need to call them up to remind them to pick up their order um, or if something unexpected happens. This one's actually pretty interesting. I was really surprised at how many folks would, you know, place an order for pickup. And we would be like, yep, it's going to be ready in about 20 or 25 minutes. And, you know, an, an hour and 20 minutes goes by and they still haven't picked it up. So we give them a call and they're like, oh, yeah, we ordered pizza. And then they come and pick it up right away and everything is good. But, um, yeah, having that phone number is really handy here. So this is also really important for deliveries. For example, you might be delivering an order to an airport, but the airport is pretty big. Maybe it has five different terminals here. Maybe the person who took the order over the phone didn't get that detail on, like, what terminal to go to. So... What do you do if you're a delivery guy with a pizza and like, you know, it's literally like a three quarters of a mile to, to kind of span to these different terminals here. So having the delivery driver call the customer, arrange where to meet, problem totally solved. Just having the phone number, super handy here. So at this place, they actually have a separate caller ID box, which is hooked up, I don't know, in between the phone and the POS system, I guess. And that will give you their name, number, and address of the caller. It's pretty handy. It doesn't always work correctly. Sometimes it puts in the wrong town. You know, sometimes that data isn't available, but I would say like, 70% of the time in this case, it's actually working pretty well. And it saves a good amount of time of having to input their full name and their number and their, you know, their address manually. And uh, yeah, one thing I definitely learned is it's very hard to hear people when they have really bad phone habits, like maybe their phone is uh, a foot away from their face and they're not on speakerphone, or maybe they are on speakerphone and it's super loud, but it, you know, the store itself is also really busy and loud. TV's blasting right there next to the register on the phone. Customers are talking to the business owner or whatever. Yeah, it's actually really hard. And also trying to get uh, someone's full address from someone who might also be drunk on the other side of the phone, not an easy task here. And again, you know, addresses are kind of weird too because street names are not always easy to spell and they're not like common words like airport or terminal or whatever. So yeah, automating as much as that, very, very nice to have that. Um, but yeah, customer information also gets saved on the POS system here too. You know, this way if the same number is input again, the address can be auto-filled out, saving a lot of that trouble here. Now, of course, on mobile phones, uh, a phone number can actually produce a different address, but uh, you know, this is one of those things where we always ask the customer to confirm their address again, but 95% of the time, uh, this is a really nice time saver. But besides that, this helps business owners learn a little bit more about who likes what. So if you know someone always orders uh, a similar type of pizza every week or two or whatever, and uh, you can just be like, oh, hey, Terry, by the way, do you want that lately cooked like last time? You know, kind of builds like a nice rapport there. Uh, technical takeaways, though, automating data input when possible is really, really good. But it's really important that you should always confirm it with another human on the other side. You know, in the case of delivery, going to the wrong address there, really poor outcome. So, you know, it's up to you, right? Maybe it's worth it to automate it and not ask for a follow up from a human if it's not super important. Totally depends here. Uh, but for online orders, like outside of this pizza place, you know, things like pre-filling a user state and zip code from a geolocation service is totally nice. But uh, you should maybe allow the customer to, or whoever it is, to edit that information as well, just in case it happens to not be correct here. You know, especially if it's for something like shipping an order. So yeah, talking a little bit about Stripe, uh, Shopify, and Square, these are all... I don't know, solutions and, you know, they all have APIs here to accept payments for various things, digital goods, pro physical products, and Square is also point of sale system, Shopify as well. I don't know if Stripe does, maybe, maybe not, uh, depends here. But, you know, if you're kind of glancing around this article here, if you squint hard enough th at this post, you know, we talked about things like orders and products and customers, you know, these different type of objects here. And it really isn't too different uh, from Stripe, Shopify, and Square's APIs to accept payments for, you know, digital and physical goods here. Like, for example, you look at Stripe here, you have, you know, things like getting your balance and charges and customers and disputes and, um, you know, payment intents is their terminology for creating something that resembles a charge, basically an asynchronous way to accept payments here. You know, we have payouts and refunds and all sorts of different payment methods like cards and, yeah, uh, Apple Pay, whatever it happens to be, or you have products and prices, coupons. I'm not going to go over all of them right here, but the idea here is to, you know, uh, Shopify has very similar things. You have the idea of like a shopping cart, a checkout, you have customers, you have different orders, you've got products, and you have all sorts of different stuff. And of course, Square has their own stuff too. You have payments and terminals and order or subscription, invoices, uh, yeah, all the stuff here. And uh, of course, you know, this blog post really only scratches the surface of what to think about. I'll be completely honest with you. I kind of wrote this post because I was pretty excited about what I briefly learned while working at a pizza place for, I don't know how many hours it was, less than 20 hours, maybe 20, something like that. But um, yeah, I just love thinking about optimizing workflows and generally just like self-improvement. It's kind of weird. Like, it's actually fun for me to like sit in the corner in there and just watch everything go and kind of just think about things in different contexts. It's like how I can apply that back to my stuff. Uh, really fun. <laughs> I guess I'm like literally the definition of the will work for pizza meme. 
um, but in a good way because like I'm the one actually wanting that in return here. So, you know, this wasn't something I even got paid for. Although now I am uh, technically a free pizza for life. Anyways, if I were building point of sale system, I'd use their APIs, uh, you know, Stripe, Shopify, and Square as inspiration, or probably honestly just use one of them directly or maybe uh, a different point of sale system if it's like specific for whatever you're selling and, and that happens to be a popular one. Most modern day POS systems here, they're basically an iPad mounted onto a register, at least all the ones that I've seen here. Um, but yeah, I, I can't believe how much I learned from just decomposing the problem of taking orders just by being in a physical location for a bit and uh, really get in, getting into the thick of it. So. I really, really encourage anyone to experience this. If you've never worked a register or a counter, it doesn't need to be a pizza place, but um, it is interesting with food because there is this idea of like, you know, front end and back end and kitchen and, you know, interacting with customers in different ways. And, you know, I'll probably make future videos about this uh, in the future. Yeah, that's how, food, how, the, how the future works. I'm not going to make like 15 pizza videos in a row related to programming, but I'm sure one or two will pop up here or there. But uh, yeah, that's about it here when it comes to payments, or at least some takeaways I had. So yeah, the video below here, meta stuff, video isn't recorded yet. But I'm actually pretty curious, like what are your payment related takeaways uh, when you've worked at a register? So yeah, drop a comment in the videos below or the video below. Yeah, if you like the video, please give it a thumbs up. It really does help a lot. Thanks a lot for watching and I will see you in the next one.